Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word. We thank you for your word. Lord, we recognize that you're the word made flesh. All the scriptures testify of you. We recognize that your spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the spirit of truth. We recognize, Father, that it is impossible for you to lie. We're about to study the very words of God, and we ask, Lord, that you would reveal your truth to us, yourself. Change us. We ask, we pray. Apply this truth to our hearts and lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. Amen. Well, we come to our last study of Abel. We first looked at Abel as a shepherd and his trust in the Lamb. We then looked at uh, the fact that Abel's blood had a voice that cried out to the Lord and God could hear his voice. And so we've, we've looked at um, Genesis. We, we mentioned in Matthew and Luke that Abel was mentioned. And the last book of the Bible that Abel is mentioned is the book of Hebrews. And so I would ask you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 11 we're told something else about Abel. And while you're turning there, I'd like to draw your attention to another passage of Scripture that, that uh, I mentioned in our last study, and that's in Matthew chapter 23, uh, verse 35, because the same thing is said about Abel in this verse as well. So let me read the passage in Hebrews first. And it's Hebrews 11, verse 4. It says, And by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it being dead yet speaketh. So there's another reference to his blood speaking. But notice what it says here in verse 4, that he was righteous. Abel is said to be righteous in the Scripture. Now, in our first study, we mentioned that we know very little about Abel. We're not really given a lot of Scripture reference about him, but those verses that we have speak volumes. But here's what we know about this man who is called righteous. We know his father and mother, Adam and Eve. Both of them sinned against the Lord. We know that he had a brother named Cain who killed him, murdered him. Now, one could maybe think, well, Abel's called righteous because, well, when you look at his family, he, he doesn't look too bad. <laughs> That's not the re reason he's called righteous. We know that he was a shepherd. That's really all we know about him personally, except for one thing. And that one thing is why he's righteous. He put his trust in the Lamb, his offering. His offering. And the way he offered it. Notice here in verse 4, not only does it say that Abel was righteous, it tells us why he was considered righteous. He offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which the sacrifice obtained witness that he was righteous. But the first two words in that verse tells us how he offered the sacrifice. By faith. He offered his sacrifice by faith. Now, he's considered righteous, but Jesus also calls him righteous in Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. It says, That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, Unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, 
whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. So Jesus says that he's righteous, and in the hall of faith, Hebrews 11, the Holy Spirit says that he is righteous, and he is righteous by faith. That is how he's righteous. Not by what we know about him, because we know very little about his, his, his life, his personal life, but we know he offered that sacrifice. And we know he did so by faith. And by that, we are told he had a testimony, a witness, that he was righteous. And if you and I desire to be righteous men, it won't be because of our parents. It won't be because of our siblings. It won't be because of anything else. It's interesting that Abel's name means vanity. There's just nothing really about Abel that would lead us to believe he was righteous. We don't have any information that would make us think that, including his name. His name means vanity. I'm going to read a passage of Scripture that speaks of all of us. In Psalm 39, verse 5, it says, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. You and I are just like Abel at our best state. Once again, in verse 11 of the same psalm, it says, Surely every man is vanity. Selah. The psalmist says, think about that. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Selah. At his best state, he's vanity. And yet he's called righteous because of his faith in the substitute lamb. And if you and I will be righteous, considered righteous, have a witness that we are righteous, it will not be from our lineage, it will not be from our occupation, it will be because of our faith in Christ. All throughout the New Testament, and even as we see as far back as Genesis and Abel's life, even before we get to Abraham, who is considered the father of faith, who believed in it was credited to him for righteousness. Abel is called a righteous man because of his faith. The just, the Bible says, shall live by faith. In the book of uh, Habakkuk, we're told that the just shall live by faith. Well, the book, four times in the, in the scripture, we're told that. In the book of Habakkuk, we're told that the just will live by faith. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, we're told that the just shall live by faith. In Hebrews 10, 38, we're told the just shall live by faith. But I want, turn with me. We won't go to Habakkuk, we'll go to Romans. Romans chapter 1. I want to read a, a couple of passages of Scripture throughout the book of Romans that declare over and over and over again that righteousness comes by faith. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 he says for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith there is a righteousness that God honors God witnesses and it's not by works it's through salvation in Christ it's by faith. In chapter 3, verse 22, we have the same type of verse given. It says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Those that believe. In verse 25 of chapter 3, it says, Whom God hath set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. A righteousness through Christ by faith. 
chapter 4, the very next chapter, verse 5, it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness by faith. Verse 9, skip down to verse 9, chapter 4. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Same chapter, verse 11. It says, And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of righteousness of the faith which he had, speaking of Abraham, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. The very next verse, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. We can move on to chapter 9, verse 30. In the book of Romans as well. Chapter 9, verse 30. It says here, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, who followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. Chapter 10, verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Over and over and over again, even though it's debated still, the scripture is clear. There is a righteousness that you and I can attain only by faith in Christ, not of works. Not of works. As a matter of fact, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says this, starting... Let's start in verse, verse 7. He says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness. Paul says, I am not seeking my own righteousness in God's presence which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. There it is again. He says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that, I may apprehend for that which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, a righteousness by faith. He said, not my own righteousness, but that of faith. In the book of Revelation, where the bride is described in Revelation 19, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Through works? Through own goodness? Absolutely not. It says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed. It was granted, not earned. She didn't graduate. It was granted to her that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That righteousness is by faith. It is in Christ. Isaiah spoke of it in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 verse 10. 
he speaks of this very thing, and he says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. A righteousness that is granted, it is imputed, it is by faith. It is not my righteousness or your righteousness, it is Christ's righteousness. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul even describing the armor of God, he says that we have a breastplate of righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, if you flip a, a, few, a, few, a few chapters back in Isaiah 59, he says in verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation. Speaking of Christ, it is his righteousness. Abel was righteous. He was a righteous man, the Bible says, because of his faith. Because of his faith. And we're told in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Many, many Christian men make a foolish mistake in trying to live their life attaining to righteousness through some type of works. Here's Abel, a man we know very little about. We couldn't assess his life to determine whether he was righteous or not righteous, put his life in a scale. The scripture doesn't give us enough information to do so. His name even means vanity. But he's called righteous. Not because of his life, but because of the life of the substitute, the Lamb. And you and I, if we want to be righteous before God, it won't be through the information of our life. It won't be our history placed in a balance and a scale to see what is good and what is bad. It has nothing to do with my life. It has everything to do with His. It's the righteousness of God by faith. Abel was a righteous man, and we see in him that righteousness comes by faith all the way back in the beginning, and it makes its way throughout all of the Scripture, and it finds its reality in our lives. As we place our faith and trust in Christ, we too are righteous before God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your righteousness. We ask that you would clothe us in that righteousness. We place our faith and our trust in you. We confess you, Lord. We believe that you are alive, risen on the third day. We are saved, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.